He began preaching in Australia in 1966 and returned to England in 1968. In 1969, he made his first trip to the United States to raise funds for his work. And uh, while he, here, he met up to be or Linda, who he calls Linda, as we all do, in Texas. And she traveled to England in the summer of 1970. Uh, uh, they were married at Aylesbury on June the 20th, 1970. Well, we know how long you've been married. Uh, they've uh, three children, Steve Thomas and Ellen, five grandchildren. Ken has preached in a number of states as well as having done mission first of all, 68 to 1972, and then from 85 to 92, and then in Canada back earlier in 70, 1977. Preached a number of gospel meetings and in various brotherhood lectureships. One time he served as one of the instructors for the West Virginia School of Preaching, served as the editor of Old Paz Magazine, which was distributed primarily in Great Britain from 86 to 95. He had articles published in a number number of brother publications, and since returning from England in 1992, he's made special trips each year to England for that work. In fact, he leaves just next week, is that right? And uh, about a week and a half after that, I go over to be with him for a week, and um, he's done work also in India, and he's been with the Belvedere Church of Christ in South Carolina since 2000. Known Ken before back into the 1970s, uh, late 70s, and um, when I was going to where we headquartered in Peterborough, which is where he was, and uh, went, I think, three, four trips while you were there, don't remember, and we were there just before he came back. And then, as I say, we've been work working there at other times when he wasn't there. But this year, I guess we'll be with him twice, this next couple of weeks or so, and then this fall, with the English lectures. I might mention when he goes over this time of year, primarily trying to strengthen some of the churches, but also uh, we have a, what we would call over here a gospel meeting all day on Saturday. This year, Ken and I are preaching all day on Saturday, so the voice is old out. Last year we did that and uh, had an older man who obeyed the gospel and seems to be coming along fine. He was there this fall when we were back for the English lectures. In the fall when we've gone over, Brother Gary Keith Sisman, who Brother Sisman was, I suppose you converted him when you were still in, or, uh, okay, worked with Graham Moulton. Graham's another native Englishman there. So uh, the work is, is, is more involved over there in a lot of places. There's not just a few percentage of the people are any kind of religion. It's very secular. Uh, but it seems that those do really pay attention and try, usually are quite dedicated. Now, the churches are turning smaller, but they're told by the same thing that we have here. And on their scale, the faithful brethren are about the same relationship to the rest of the churches as we would be here in these churches. But it's, it's an enjoyable work. It's a good work. It's, you really, I try to tell this to brethren who have never gone overseas. I think Ken and others who have gone will concur that the brethren where there's just a few folks and many of them new Christians and they never have known what we've taken for granted over here, they appreciate just so much, just the fellowship, Amen. just the fellowship alone is just, they just thrive on it and they just thoroughly enjoy it. So sometimes you think about, well, the teaching opportunities. Well, that's important. That's one we go. But on the other hand, they're in of just your being there and uh, being around them, enjoy the, the, the association and fellowship. So I thought I'd mention a few of those things. We appreciate Ken for his love, his ability, the works we've just mentioned, and his standing for the truth and willing to sacrifice for it. And we want to hear him speak now on the subject of the fellowship scripture, 17, 20 through 21, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, and Mark 9, 8 through 41. Brother Tim, me come preach to us. Thank you, David. Just before getting in, I'll just add something there about the one-day lectureship thing. What we do when we have that, there's several congregations scattered throughout the country. And this is an opportunity for them to get together, both for teaching and for fellowship. 
and also they opened it up, advertised it, and so consequently that's how we were able to get the one visitor last year that uh, as a result of his being with us eventually obeyed the gospel before we all came home. I want to appreciate the elders here for their stand for the truth, for their lectureship. Thank you, Brother well for all of his efforts. Appreciate, too, the cons for opening up their home to me. It's been a privilege to be in their house. And above all, for the spring congregation, for the sweet fellowship that we have together in Christ as we gather together. You know, the theme of the lectureship this year, fellowship from God or man, is one that's very vital in our day and age and one that must have been vital. Back in 1990, the Belleville, Bellevue Church in Pensacola, Florida had a lectureship on fellowship. And from what we observed taking place in the Brotherhood, I think the statement that Tom Waycaster made on that occasion was the theme of the 23rd Annual Bellevue Lectures, Christian Fellowship, is certainly timely. From what we observed taking place in the Brotherhood, one would few have any concept of what constitutes fellowship. I'm in agreement with what Ben, and I think it's even more so because it seems that not much has been learned in the intervening years and this is vital because some either have never learned what the concept of biblical fellowship is or they really don't know or they're not putting into practice what you know. We need to realize fellowship not simply a horizontal matter between our fellow man. Primarily there is the vertical concept that is our fellowship with God. And being in fellowship with our fellow man has no value unless also we have fellowship with God. Fellowship is available to all, but not all will enjoy that fellowship. And thus, as a result, we are not able to fellowship all. I want to quote a statement from Robert Taylor's book on fellowship that I've studied quite over the years. And he states, relative to Christian fellowship, God should have the first word, the last word, and every word in between. This is giving God his precious priority, his rightful due. Relative to fellowship, God has all prerogatives. God does the defining of fellowship, and it is his regal right to do so. Jehovah sets the boundaries of Christian fellowship, and it is his prerogative so to do. He determines whom he will and will not fellowship. He determines whom we are the fellowship and whom we are not the fellowship. He the blessings and boundaries of real and true fellowship. He determines what fel when fellowship is to be withdrawn and when it is to be restored. God has treated the doctrine of fellowship like he has treated the doctrine of conversion. He sets stipulations. He legislates the laws. He conveys the conditions. He defines the demands. He does the same with the doctrine of fellowship. His supremacy and sovereignty reach throughout every fundamental facet of Christianity as a system of truth. God treats the topic of fellowship as he does the nature of the church or Bible doctrinal things. He does the legislating. He is in the driver's seat all the way. That's a very accurate statement. And yes, we must be more interested in what God has to say about this matter. And truly, God should have the first word, the last word, and every word in between. And oh, that Brother Taylor would, and others indeed, would practice the very thing he teaches clearly in this particular book concerning this extremely serious and vital matter. You know, in the long ago, the prophet Amos, Amos 3 and 3, can two walk together except they be agreed. As we've already indicated it. Men could be in fellowship with one another, putting they're agreed, or as some would say, well, as long as we agree to disagree. But Scripture teaches that we must first have fellowship with God. Can we have fellowship with God unless we are in agreement with Him? Our lesson this afternoon is going to be looking at some of the fellowship Scriptures that impact upon this. Teaching and fellowship are unquestionably very related. And thus, there cannot be true fellowship without obedience to the teaching of God's Word. But Augustus Nichols 
wrote in uh, the Bible way back in 1973 these words. Fellowship there must not be upon the basis of false doctrine, but by abiding in the realm of revealed truth as it is in the Bible. God does not want a unity or fellowship which is built on compromising the Word of God. We must believe, teach, and follow the truth whether or not we're in fellowship with others. We need to be Christians. Fellowship automatically results from strictly believing in the truth of the gospel, or in other words, the loyalty in following the teaching of the New Testament scriptures under which we live today. In the matter of fellowship, Fellowship always involves union, but not all union is fellowship. You know the old statement about you can tie two cats together by the tail, throw them over a clothesline. You've got union, but there's no way you're going to get unity. Fellowship also <coughs> involves the matter of partnership. Curtis Cates made this statement. It means partnership, working together agreeably, having one common goal toward which we strive and be together. Think of the homogeneity involved in the fellowship of Christ-minded brothers and sisters. If there is no agreement, there can be no fellowship. How important that is that we can the city's matters. You know, the passages that we're to look at this afternoon in uh, John 17, Ephesians 4, and Mark 9 are passages that are normally studied in connection with of unity. But as Franklin Camp so well stated long ago, worship and unity are but two different sides of the same principle. They're involved together. John 17, 20 through 21, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through them, that they may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world might believe that thou hast sent me. This, of course, out of the longest recorded prayer of our Lord, truly the Lord's prayer, as a that found in Matthew chapter 6 and other places. And here we see that one of the pleas that our Lord makes here is for unity amongst those who would be his followers. It reveals very clearly the Lord's concern concerning the matter of unity. Thomas Ryan made this statement, the prayer of Jesus which is recorded in John 17, he made it clear that unity is a matter of great importance. To deny the cruciality of unity is to deny Jesus and his teaching. To strive for unity is a matter of obligation which God has laid unto us. Indeed, we are to give diligence to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, Ephesians 4.3. But you notice, Jesus doesn't use the word unity in this particular passage, but rather the word one. That word one, as, we, as it's translated in English, is a word here that is used to give a strong, clearer concept than what the word unity often implies. You know, unity means different things to different people. But this idea of oneness is a cardinal teaching of the New Testament. And that Jesus should pray that his followers throughout the centuries reveals the great importance our Lord placed on that oneness. And true disciples desire to know and practice unity. The basis of that oneness is twofold in nature. First, that men and women should believe on me their word, verse 20. It is the word of the apostles in the sense that they proclaimed it and they lived it. And one cannot become a believer apart from the apostolic word. There's no other way to bring man to God except through the teaching of the word of God. Secondly, oneness is based upon the abiding doctrine of the word of God. John tells us, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the word of Christ, he is both the Father and the Son. Second John 9. The oneness then is limited to those who are in Christ Jesus. And we know how one gets into Christ. By being baptized into him, Galatians 3, 26, 27, 6, 3, and 4. And such enables his followers to have that oneness with all who are in him. Lord prayed for unity, not union. As we've indicated, there's a great difference between the two. And thus the Lord... The the prayer of our Lord for unity 
that which might come from meeting together the same group. You know, you can put cows and pigs out in the same pasture, but they're not one. We need to remember division never brings honor to God, for God is not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians 33. Yet some think, thank God for all the various churches that they're able to join the church of their choice. But those who do so fail to recognize that such was never the will of the Lord the Father. In fact, the church is to be one, as we will see in Ephesians 4 in a moment. The unity for which Christ prayed would bless the world. Just imagine if all who claim to follow Christ were truly his disciples, one in him as Jesus prayed. But sadly, division has plagued the cause of Christ for centuries and brought more confusion than one can imagine. The united religious world will be the greatest testimony to the work of Jesus Christ Lord and would help the world see that what he taught from the Father was indeed the truth, John 17 and 8. But sadly, vision among professed followers has turned many away from going the way of the Lord. And thus, when different and contrary things are being taught, is it any wonder that many have difficulty in understanding what New Testament Christianity really is? Unity of teaching, practice, and life the very basis of the Savior's prayer must be answered in order that all who travel toward it to end the Lord's way. The concept of unity and diversity, the idea of simply agreeing to disagree, as we've heard before, is not the Lord's way and is no part of the Lord's prayer. Because we are taught that the disciples are to all speak the same thing and that there are to be no divisions among them. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. But this our Lord prayed for thus is based upon that sand doctor. In 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 we read, For the time will come when they will not endure self, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. Notice it's sound doctrine, the body of doctrine, not doctrines as if many different teachings can be acceptable but doctrine is part of the single body of truth that is to be taught. And the only basis for unity in teaching and practice and within the Word of God. There is indeed no other way to achieve doctrinal unity except through the only source of sound doctrine, the Word of God. Unity that we pray for is seen in the early church in Acts 4 and 32. So Acts 2.42 tells us, why? Because they can steadfastly in the apostles' dumb fellowship. Also, Paul urged the Philippian brethren to stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the God. Jude wrote about contending only for the faith that was once for all to the saints, Jude 3. It is the doctrine, the goal, the faith that comes the faith upon which one begins to build a unity. And when men follow such, Fail to follow such, they leave the unity for which our Lord prayed. The kind of oneness for which the Lord prayed was to be patterned after the perfect pattern, as thou Father art in me, and I in thee, verse 21, John 17. Can anyone imagine the Father and Son being divided on matters of doctrine? We get advocates of false doctrine, the unity and diversity I have us believe that such is acceptable in harmony with our Lord's prayer. The unity that we should have attained by being into Christ and we get into him through our obedience to the gospel. In order to maintain that fellowship with the Father, we must continue to walk in the light. 1 John 1 and verse 9. We must willingly be obedient to the teach of word in order that we might indeed be in fellowship with the Father and the Son. If we're not in fellowship with then any fellowship we might enjoy would be the wrong kind of fellowship. Notice this does from Brother Noah Hackworth. He said, if there is unity to be fellowship, both are based upon the commands of Christ. Whether we have unity and fellowship depends upon whether we are obedient. 
In the very shadow of the cross, he prayed for the words which thou gavest me, I have given unto them, and they received them. And know the truth that I have come from thee, John 17 and 8. I have given them thy word, verse 14. Neither pray for I for these, for these alone do I pray, but for them also that believe on me through their word. They may all be one, even thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they all so may be one in us, verses 20 and 21. It was through the reception of the Apostles' word that the unity for which the Lord prayed was accomplished. And fellowship was enjoyed for the same reason. I want to quote from a uh, bulletin article by B.J. Clark of last November. He said, in short, Jesus prayed that his followers, i.e. those who believed on him through the word of the Apostles, would enjoy and participate in the same kind of unity shared by the Father and the Son. Obviously, there are some aspects of the unity and other ones that cannot duplicate. For example, both the Father and the Son share the unity of being eternal in nature, a quality we can never attain. On the other hand, there are aspects of unity between the Father and the Son that we can emulate. The late and esteemed brother Guy and Woods observed that G Father are one in the Godhead, one in communion, aim, and work. This is total, complete, undivided unity. When applied to the disciples, unity in all matters of doctrine and practice. It would be po not be possible to state more clearly and unmistakably the Lord Lee for the unity of fellowship for his people. Division is taught to be sinful wherever it mentioned. The oneness between the Father and the Son, but the Clark continues, does embrace and include unity of teaching. It is utterly inconceivable to think of the Father teaching one thing and Jesus teaching the exact opposite of the matter. And Brother Clark goes on to ask his readers to contemplate the Father and the Son having different teaching concerning how one becomes a Christian, church government, the pattern for worship, and then states, what kind of unity would that be? The very definition of Christianity is built upon the unity of teaching that exists between the Father and the Son. And we agree with that statement, but we would ask, why is that brethren, including Brother Clark, will not apply this principle consistently? What about the re-evaluation, reaffirmation of elders, the intent doctrine with regards to marriage as taught by Dave Miller? It seems some in their thing act are using selective application of the scriptures, and in so doing they show respect of persons. The teaching of the authority of the New Testament is not of the doctrine of Christ, and as such, not a doctrine that the Father and the Son hold uh, in their oneness. I want to move on now, in course of time, to Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. I won't read the passage, you know the passage. But here, Paul, the proper attitude that must exist to maintain unity in order that one might continue in fellowship with the Father and the Son as well as with brethren. And after having established the attitudes that must exist in verses 1 through 3, he then identifies seven ones of unity in verses 4 through 6 that are necessary to maintain true fellowship and unity. Note these are not the only ones of unity, as some erroneously teach, as there are others that would be just as vital. We must all God has to say on a given topic until we conclude that one has attained the truth. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, John 8, 31. We cannot overlook anything that God teaches and remember that the truth must be taught, for it alone will make men free, John 8, 32. Passage which we have seen then talks about the attributes that we have and then entreats the, to, the brethren to live in harmony with the elevated privilege that they have been given. Their manner of life might show and manifest lowliness or the meekness, being patient in the midst of adversity, loving with the affirmatives or humilities of the other, affirmatives of others and forbearance as they love and they fulfill their responsibilities. Yoga goes on about things. First of all, the seven elements, just briefly stated. There is but one body, the body of Christ, the church, with Christians constituting various parts of the body. I won't take the time to quote all the scriptures here. 
They're all in the manuscript. When one is in Christ, he is in that one body. To be members of one another as truly and as intimately as are the various parts of the human body. He then speaks of the one spirit, that holy that was set to God the apostles into all truth. John 16, 13. Then there is the one hope, the hope of eternal life, Titus 2, 10, etc. Fourth, the one that is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, John 20, 28. Then there is the one faith. This is not about faith, but the body of belief, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, found in various passages of God's Word. Then he writes concerning the one baptism being commanded by the Lord, baptism in water for the remission of sins. And the last of the seven Paul mentions is that there is but one God. There is but one God, the creator of heaven and earth, revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thus in these seven ones we see unity of organization, one body, a unity of life, one spirit, a unity of purpose, one a unity of authority, Lord, a unity of speech, one faith, a unity of worship, one. And at the center of this unity is Christ with everything revolving around him. Note the unity of the Spirit that Paul speaks of can only be maintained through a strict adherence to the Apostles' doctrine. Mr. Dobbs correctly wrote these words, For the same reason, the Apostles' doctrine should bind us together in deep devotion, Error will drive us apart in dreadful division. Therefore, false teaching must not be allowed. The bane of this present day is a disposition to tolerate just about everything except intolerance. Much of the boasted union of religious groups is little more than agreeing to disagree. It's a union based upon ignorance and unbelief. You know, when brethren acquiesce to false teaching, there is only union, not unity. You know, for almost a generation or so, there have been those who have spoken concerning this idea of unity and diversity. Brethren agreeing to disagree. But you know, some of those who stood so firm against that are now practicing a very form of unity and diversity in the name of balance. How tragic. Brethren, well, there can be no balance when one tolerates false teaching. Neither can there be unity of the Spirit and the bonds of peace when one moves away from the Apostle Doctrine. You will remember the words that were written by Rubel Shelley back a number of years ago when he said, My suggestion is that only such items as pertain directly to the seven ones of Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 are of such a nature as to qualify as issues of faith, a doctrinal test of fellowship. If one denies one or more of these necessary items of Christian doctrine, he becomes subject to rebuke immediately, and if he cannot be taught to repentance, disfellowship. The only item I would add to the list of seven things in Ephesians 4 is one which is surely assumed by appealing to this or other biblical text for authority in religion, the all-sufficient word of God. But note what he goes state. One who denies any element of the one faith, i.e. the gospel message of redemption, through the death, burial, election of Christ, has turned back from the truth and are walking in the footsteps of those whom John rebukes in his three epistles. Note how she implies the one faith only applies to the teaching concerning salvation. Where did he get such an idea from? What good reason would there be for it to mean something different other than the terms that are used elsewhere in the scripture? Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, encouraging the brethren to stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Is that just the matters of salvation? What about Jude 3, contending earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints, etc.? For years, sound brethren have opposed the teaching and practice of Rubel Shelley and other false teachers, but in the last nearly two years, some who spoke and wrote so clearly against fellowshipping those who are not in fellowship with God are now willing to fellowship certain false teachers. Mark Bass wrote in the lectureship there in 1998, this same principle applies to the use of false teachers within the church. When we invite known false teachers into our congregations to speak, we are telling others we endorse that individual and his teachings. 
It is observed to argue with some half he has agreed not to mention that while he is here. Regardless of whether he brings his false doctrine out into the open or keeps it to himself, it is often acknowledged that he espouses such error. Those who know it will assume that we endorse the error and we fellowship and use the... Then he goes on to quote a couple of other brothers, Wayne Jackson and Alan Hyas. And then he continues, in the intervening years, this attempt at unity and diversity has gained momentum among many brethren. They're w willing to overlook things such as instrumental music, music, women preachers, and a host of other things in an effort to fit those in the denominational world. When all is said and done, they may have union, but not unity. Sadly, those who speak out in opposition to such compromises are castigated and called all sorts of unpleasant names. Does that sound familiar with what's going on today with those who have determined to fellowship certain false teachers? Tommy Hicks wrote this a number of years ago. I want to contend that it is possible to refuse fe fellowship the, the unfruitful works of darkness while continuing to fellowship the ones producing those works. Think, is Jesus merely talking about trees and fruits they produce, or is he using this figure to illustrate the fact that false teachers and others producing the unfruitful works of darkness are actually evil? Herein lies the problem. Can a good tree, a tree of light, produce unfruitful works of darkness? No. Can not produce unfruitful works of darkness? How is it possible to be in fellowship with the kind of tree that does? It cannot. You tell me he believed what he wrote in 1997. I trust he did. But then why are he and others now fellowshipping false teachers producing the fruitful works of darkness? The preaching of the Bible hasn't changed, but some have changed their practice of put, putting themselves in conflict with their own previous teaching. The next passage we want to look at briefly because of time is Mark 9, 38 through 41. If you want to open your Bibles there, you'll see the passage. One that is often taken out of context, and we know that when one is taken out of context, it becomes a pretext. And a passage that is misused can lead to erroneous conclusions. The passage in Mark 9 and its parallel in Luke chapter 9 are used by denominationalists and liberals in an effort to pervert the truth that's promoting false doctrine. When honest, one honest studies the fact was to see the truth of the teaching that is in, found therein and we encourage us to be true disciples, profitable for the cause of Christ. Notice the one under discussion followeth not us, simply showing that he was not one of the twelve or associated with their specific work. Couldn't the false teacher spreading false doctrine? Let's note four reasons for this. First, he was casting out devils. That's a power that was given to the Apostle Mark 3.15 and to at least to the others, Luke 10, one time. Also, we note the Lord condoned the work that he was doing as he instructed John and the other disciples to forbid not. Jesus clearly indicates that a miracle of he, he was casting out devils, not making some false claims. Further, we note that the Lord clearly indicated the individuals on our part. And again, we note that this individual was casting them out in thy name. That is the name of Jesus by his authority. You know, we note also when the Sanhedrin had asked Peter and John, by what power, by what name have you done this, Acts 4 and 7? They were speaking of the same thing. And we all Colossians 3, 17, to do all in Jesus by his authority. You know, there are those today that claim to be teaching, preaching, working, even casting out devils or demons in the name of Christ. But our Lord would reject them, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. They're condemned because they're doing those things, not doing those things according to the will of the Lord. They were not actually casting out demons, but professor. John spoke of this individual who was actually casting them out. He was indeed giving heed to Christ and well of him, Mark 9, 39. And again, Matthew 7, 18 says, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. You know, if this passage taught what false teachers claim it teaches, it would contradict other plain statements of Scripture. You know, after God Smith is one of this particular passage. In his book, 
who is my brother. And I'm going to go into this in detail. I believe someone else is going to be looking at that book later on. But just want to note one passage there when he talks about faith fellowship like family. But he goes on to speak about his association with the Aston Underhill Free Church in the Cotswolds of England that he attended on a regular basis there. He writes about this evangelical free church, that's what they're called over there in England. He writes about it in very glowing terms, describes their services and characteristics, some of which follow the New Testament pattern, others do not. He speaks of them as being family, like family, but not family, and then declares he has a fellowship with them, though he uses the word association. But in order to justify his fellow this group, he seeks to make Mark 9 here an example of that kind of faith fellowship, kind of like Rubel Shelley with his big F and little f fellowship. You know, when one is content to blur the lines of fellowship, one passage is as good as another to abuse in order to try and justify what you're doing. Rupel sought to find two levels of fellowship. Actually, if God Smith comes up with five. You know, sometimes we can also get a perverted idea of this particular passage that can also prove a verse. I want to add this here. Some people think that people could, cannot hear the gospel, be obedient to it, that somebody over from the United States of America to give a preach to them. Ever heard that? But yet we know the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. Luke 8 and verse 11. Those who study themselves can come to a knowledge of the truth and be obedient to it without ever having seen an American preacher. The church spread in the early 1800s both in this part of the world and over the country without people knowing about each other. They became Christians by obeying the sexual that they did in the first century. And thus they were in fellowship with the Father and the Son often without even knowing of the existence of others. But they were in fellowship because they possessed that like precious faith. And they taught that same truth. And when they came into contact with mother, they had unity they had fellowship in the Lord. Matt Lyon wrote an article regarding unity concerning the church and the exchange Bibles that took place in 2006 between some liberal preachers in the church and some preachers in the independent Christian church. I hope I'm going to get time to get through these last few points here in the conclusion. God himself asked, can two walk together? It's Unless they are agreed, Amos 3.3, 3, he said, we cannot walk with those who, with who we disagree on such a vital salvation issue. The pretense of union on the basis of exchanging Bibles or other such friendly gestures can suffice for conversion to what says in his word. Now we agree with Mark in what he stated, but he either needs to blame and prove the issues that plague the church of our Lord today to reach that level of salvation issues, or he needs to be consistent application of this principle with respect to fellowship and unity with false teachers both within and without the church. And then there are many others who need to explain and prove such in relation to the errors of Dave Miller and others. Fellowship and unity go hand in hand. Fellowship is a result of unity. Sadly, these two concepts have been abused to the point that man desires fellowship and unity with to the important point that they ignore the deity in the equation. We must follow the truth. I want to refer to a couple of things here at this particular juncture that I want to fit in we conclude. Concerning this matter of fellowship and uh, uni unity with the independent Christian church that's been banded about by some of the liberals amongst us. First of all, I want to notice something that's said in the Christian Chronicle this month. Church is an identity crisis. And it's interesting that one of the first people they speak to here is one of the most liberal preachers in, in the area, Steve Sandifer of Southeast Central. But they make a statement in here concerning, well, there are 
13,000 a cappella congregations, and then it goes on to speak about being so many instrumental congregations. Where'd they come up with such an idea? They're either the Lord's church or they're not. Are they, are they in fellowship because they use the instrument? But we don't, you know, this unity and diversity going to seed as well. But you know, it's not just the instrument that's an issue. In the February issue of the Restoration Herald, I have here an article from the editor lamenting some of the problems in the independent Christian church at this time, and he's saying, we we're at the point of deciding again concerning certain things with respect to truth. And he lists a number of items, and read some of them, more than I'll have time to read. Is baptism filled with salvation? In baptism are we united with Christ and thus become a part of his body, the church? Can people become part of Christ's church without baptism for the remission of sin? Can the main sinner's prayer be substituted for baptism was commanded by Christ? Important is that. Can we have preachers in our pulpits who do not believe in Bible baptism? If we can't have them preaching, can we have them teach preacher boys in Bible colleges? You say, surprised at how many denominationalists are employed by our colleges these days. Is baptism Think of those who do not believe that it is speak on important convention programs. And on he goes. There's, there's a whole list of over a dozen things, all basically connected with baptism, that they don't even have unity in teaching on either. And yet we're saying that we've got fellowship with them. Somebody doesn't even understand what Bible fellowship is all about. Got this bulletin this uh, last week of the 11th. Article: What the Church Does Not Need. And it's a good article, but it makes a statement in here. The church does not need false teachers and false doctrines. Paul in Colossians 2, 2 2 Peter 2, 3, and 1 John 4, and Jude 3, Terse, Matt, Mystic, tells us why. We need people in whose truth is safe. Truth has never been safe in the hands of false teachers. That's true, Brother Taylor. Then why do you allow that thing to go on when you are in fellowship with those who are teaching false doctrine? And many others are involved with that. One other thing I just want to go, and I know I'm going to be out of time, but I'll conclude it this way. You all know what's um, been stated about by uh, Rick Ashley and what's going on at Richard. Hills and how he's defying the introduction of instrumental music into the worship. Do we need to have the both and church? Both with the instrument and without the instrument. Brethren, we've got folk now in the matter with regards to fellowship that want the both and church when it comes to the matter of false teaching back to certain individuals. We've got to have the both and church when it comes to the matter of the reevaluation of elders. The both and church when it comes to the intent doctrine on marriage. How many more things are they going to bring in? Are they going in the back teaching on the spirit? What else are they going to bring into this both and church that they want to have that is contrary to worship, that is taught in the passages that we've been looking at this afternoon? Brethren, there are some that need to take note and to answer for where they're going in this matter of fellowship. Thank you. Well, old boy, I'd say, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I we, we've always had a good time together. And we've always had an argument over whether we're still the colonies or not. I he, the no, you don't. <laughs> of course, he thinks we ought to have gotten to World War II in 1909. I can't help but they get themselves in a mess, then we have to drag them out. You, well, everybody was doing the appeasement process that they're doing today. Yeah, I know. They don't learn, do they? Nobody wants to learn. And that's where we're saying we're right back to where we're on the church, aren't we? That's right. Mm-hmm. It goes around, comes around. That was a very fine presented material, and all of it was good. We appreciate it very much. We've got about 10 minutes, and we'll take that 10 minutes for a break, try to stretch, and 
Well, you say get your eyelids propped open or whatever. That was good. Thank you very much. We stand.